Check, check. Check, check. Cassandra and Michael. I can hear you. I can hear you. So we can see if we can hear you on this side, guys. Hello? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Okay, we can't hear that. Can you hear me? Put a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right, cool. Okay, can you guys say something again? Yeah, can you hear us now? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. Um, could you share your, um, your, your slides so we could share it on the screen here at the hotel? You want us to share our slides from our computer? Yeah. Oh. Oh, right there. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Sorry. I mean, I can share it if you want. Whatever's easiest. Oh, no. We got it. Sorry, I just mis I misunderstood. Okay. Can we click through on our end? No. No. No We'll click for you. Yeah, we'll click for you. Just uh, let us know when to click to the next slide. Mine has a lot of animations in it. It might be easier if I share from my own screen to click through. I just want to highlight that, but happy to do whatever way makes the most sense. Um, do you go ahead and try to share yours now and let's test that. Okay. Um, share. move this over to that screen yeah. when she's ready. So who's going first? What slide is first? The, the, the so I'm second presenter, so I would yeah, go after I think mine, mine's first. OK. Uh, I'm going to share this PowerPoint over here right now. Th then we'll um, switch. Perfect. My timer. You guys are all set up and everything. Cool. Last presentation of the day. Yay. Hope everyone's not falling asleep yet. No, they're all wired up. <laughs> Post coffee break. They're they're uh, ready to go for the most exciting thing in Indian country next to free food. <laughs> Raffle. Raffles. <laughs> We'll start in a couple of minutes. We're scheduled for two, so uh, sessions are ending. That people are coming in still. Okay, great. Well, I'm happy to see so many people still here. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't see the wow. room. Are there many folks? There's like five. Cool. <laughs> cool. I think we have about 30 people in here. Great. Maybe more, but we're still, people still are coming in probably. Great. 
Well, I see there's a lot of tribal representation. That's good. Okay, it's close enough to two o'clock since we're really tight on time. I want to start up. Uh, okay, first of all, I, my name is Clifford Banuelos. A lot of you know me. I am the Tribal State Environmental Liaison with the Intertribal Council of Nevada, also a member of the Tomoke Tribe of Western Shoshone. And in my role, I work a lot with uh, nonprofits, and uh, you really look at them for data that's non governmental uh, and just good reading and stuff. <laughs> um, but in Nevada, as many of you know, uh, we have lithium mining really coming to town and it looks like it's gonna be like a gold boom. Uh, right now we're looking at over 18,000 uh, wells around Nevada looking for lithium. So much that it's making the water table go down uh, six to eight feet in areas. So um, so uh, I saw Nature Conservancy a couple years ago completed a uh, study on extraction uh, of lithium and it was very interesting. Uh, well, we'll probably go back to the first, uh, that's okay. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> I wanted to discuss with them or have them discuss extraction methods. They also released a, a re more recent report. And I say Nature Conservancy, a lot of that stuff is contracted out. And, and so Michael Clifford from uh, Nature Conservancy is gonna talk at first about uh, their studies and their, their, their work. And then after that, um, Great, Basin, Great Basin Resource Watch is on, and that's Cassandra, and I am forgetting Cassandra's boss's name right now. Um, John Hatter. Which, John Hatter. And they're gonna talk about uh, their concerns. They made comments on the permitting and the EIS for the Thacker Pass lithium mine, uh, things, specific things like wastewater storage that was not agreed upon and um, I can speak a little bit about the approval process of that. But uh, so she, they're going to go afterwards and talk about some things in that aspect and tailings and other things if you want to discuss that too. And uh, so let's start off first with Michael, if you can introduce yourself. Thanks, Clifford. Uh, my name is Michael Clifford. I'm a conservation scientist with the Nature Conservancy. So I do a lot of large scale um, analyses, uh, particularly uh, GIS and spatial analyses. Are you ready for Thank me you. to? Jump, jump in, or do you want to keep introducing us? Just one more uh, thing in, in that. Uh, what I ask is we're going to do the presentations first. There's two of them, uh, maybe three, but two of them. And then you, you uh, ask questions after the presentation is what I ask. And uh, so with that, yeah, if you can start out, Michael. Great. Thanks, Clifford. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sad I can't see you all. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about lithium extraction and the potential environmental impacts. It's going to focus a lot on Nevada because that's where I'm based in um, and that's where most of the lithium deposits occur. Um, in this, this, this basin here, this valley in this photo is the Esmeralda Valley in sort of west central Nevada. Um, and on the left side of this photo and on the right side of this photo, there are two proposed lithium mines. Uh, on the left side of the photo, there's also about 100,000 acres of solar facilities that are um, going through the permitting phase. So just to give an idea of what kind of pressures are on these valleys, um, and this isn't just exclusive to this valley, it just happened to be a valley I was in. Um, so next slide, please. So lithium has become a, a, a huge commodity, partly to address climate change um, in, in, the renew, in the transition to renewable energy. So this is EV batteries, as well as batteries uh, storage for these large scale solar facilities. So most of these large scale solar facilities now have uh, lithium ion batteries to store energy for when the sun goes down. And these are batteries that are you know, the size of a tractor trailer. They're huge. Um, as the government has, has, has changed policies to uh, enable greater access to renewable energies. We thought it was important to understand the potential impacts of extraction, uh, particularly of lithium. Next slide, please. Last year, the US Geological Survey released a report on 50 critical minerals. Now, uh, now a critical mineral is defined as a non-fuel mineral essential to the economic or national security of the US uh, and which has supply chain vulnerabilities. Lithium is on that list. 
Uh, next slide, please. And by my count, there's 21 other minerals used for renewable energy generation. Now, this next hour, we're focused on lithium. But when you go back home, I want you to think about beyond just lithium and that if the, if there's an energy transition and there's a lot more renewables, there's a lot of mining that has to take place, um, including most of these other minerals on here, which are projected to, to need to be increased between 100 and 500 uh, percent, which means there's a whole bunch of mining that's going to be occurring to make up for that demand. Next slide, please. Where that touches down, this is a map released by the USGS as well, is mostly in the Western United States. So these colored sort of blobs on the states show where the USGS is sort of hunting for minerals, for these critical minerals. So Nevada is almost entirely covered, Idaho, Southern California, Southern Arizona, lots of Utah. Now these are areas because of the mountains and the geology have a lot of minerals but also because of the public lands uh, managed by Forest Service and BLM uh, are easier to permit than some of the other locations, particularly in the Eastern United States. Uh, next slide, please. Now shifting back to lithium, uh, a lot of this is driven by policies as well as the economy. Um, now this is sort of a, a, this is a bit of a goofy slide because there's some COVID blips in here from 2021 to 2022 where there's some supply chain issues. But this is the cost of lithium over the past five years. Uh, Pre-COVID, lithium is 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 quite uh, quite low. Now the the units are in Chinese yen, which is what most of these types of economic analyses are. But uh, the patterns are the same if you convert to U.S. dollars, where uh, the cost of lithium over the past couple of years has increased by uh, five to six uh, times. Now, most lithium is mined in Australia through hard rock mining, um, but there's also a lot of lithium mined in uh, South America, so Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, as well as China. The United States currently produces 1% of the world's lithium, and that is a mine in, in the Clayton Valley of Nevada. So that's the only mine uh, present for lithium in the United States. It's been running since the 1970s. Uh, next slide. Now, last year, uh, the Nature Conservancy released this report, uh, the potential lithium extraction in the United States, environmental, economic, and policy implications. So I'm going to focus on the environmental part. Uh, it's about an 80-page report. Um, the environmental part is much more of my expertise. Uh, I put the co-authors up here uh, because they all contributed uh, immensely to this, this report. I want to point out in the lower right, uh, the report is freely available online. Uh, the easiest way to get there is probably just Google the Nature Conservancy and lithium, and it'll be the first thing that pops up. I also want to point out that all the data that we used in this analysis is publicly available data sets. Um, so there's no proprietary data that we used in any of this. And in the supplemental information, it'll tell you exactly where we uh, acquired those data sets. Most of them are freely available. Next slide. And so what we found was that there were nine states with lithium projects. Now, a lithium project was defined as having a company that, that held uh, lithium mineral rights, had a plan, had a plan of, of developing a mine project site. So there's lots of lithium mine claims. Oftentimes, those don't have any sort of plan associated with them. It's just sort of more speculation. So we were looking for actual lithium project sites that were trying to come online and be developed. What we identified was that, so Nevada has 79% of the country's lithium deposits. Now these are known lithium deposits and we're finding lithium all the time. So this, these numbers shift a little bit depending on where, where and when a deposit's found. To put that in perspective though, if you were to take the global lithium production in the year 2020, Nevada could supply that demand for 85 years. So there's a huge amount of lithium in Nevada. The next closest state with large lithium deposits is California, and then actually North Carolina, and then Utah and Arizona. Next slide, please. Now, lithium is really interesting because it comes in two different forms. There's brines, which are, are these sort of really salty water, uh, groundwater, oftentimes hundreds to thousands of feet below the surface. Uh, evaporative concentration where those brines are pumped up to the surface 
and allow to just evaporate in sort of these dry desert areas is the most uh, one of the most common ways of, of getting uh, getting lithium. Um, that's what the Clayton Valley site is in Nevada is a, an evaporative concentration of brine. The other way is through direct lithium extraction. Now, direct lithium extraction is an interesting uh, way of getting lithium, partly because conceptually it's really exciting and that there's going to be a less, there's likely to be less footprint and less disturbance on the surface. So for example, evaporative concentration from brine requires huge, huge areas, thousands of acres, whereas direct lithium extraction is likely tens of acres to hundreds of acres. But um, there's still unknowns about water usage. There's still unknowns about how that impact, how that type of extraction impacts the aquifer and the groundwater systems. It's also totally proprietary. Companies have spent hundreds of millions to billions of dollars and it's still not fully functional yet. It's never been proven to work at commercial scales. The other types of, of lithium are, are bound in rocks and clays. And these are much more traditional um, types of of mining, so open pit mining, strip mining, and things like that. Now, the chemicals are different than what you'd uh, expect as like a gold mine or a silver mine, but conceptually the footprint on the landscape is fairly similar. Next slide, please. So this is a map of all of the lithium projects we had identified. Now this map is 18 months old, so um, there's probably more than more than these on here by now because there's lithium projects coming online all the time. In fact, I know there's more than what we showed. There's, so there's 72 across the country. And just to walk through this, this map, there's a lot going on here. In the Western US, there's all these sort of gr uh, brownish dots. Those brownish dots are where lithium is found in geothermal brine. So any sort of geothermal facility that's coming online, test those brines that it's using. And if there was lithium in it, it went on this map. And so that just shows that there's a lot of lithium out there. Um, the sort of pink blobs and polygons, particularly uh, throughout the West, those are where the geological survey um, has identified based on their sampling, what they call a lithium focus area. And those are where there's high concentrations of lithium in the rocks and in the brines. Those other larger dots are the project locations. Um, so there's a huge concentration in, in Western Nevada, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but the different types of, uh, and, and the colors correspond to different types of extraction, different methods. So red would be hard rock or open pit extraction. Blue is direct lithium extraction. And that sort of greenish color is it a, is the evaporative concentration of brine. Um, and, and, and I'll mention that all of these companies said they would use evaporative concentration of brine, Every regulatory agency that I've discussed, as well as the companies themselves, say that that is unlikely to occur because of the massive, massive water usage of that type of extraction, and that those will have to shift to direct lithium extraction. But we left them as evaporative concentration because that's what was in the company's data and what they said that they would be doing to extract these. Next slide, please. So our analysis was fairly simple. We took the boundary of the, the project areas, which is this sort of Pac-Man looking project uh, on, this, on the left side of the, uh, on this map. Uh, this is a project that's in Northern Nevada, Southern Oregon. And we put a two mile buffer around it, thinking that if a company is going to develop this project, they all need roads for access, transmission line for power. There's going to be dust that blows off site. There's going to be noise pollution, light pollution. And so the impact will not be held directly to that site. And so we just did a very simple overlay analysis. We took a whole bunch of other GIS data. So things like bald eagle habitat, golden eagle habitat, desert tortoise habitat, mule deer habitat. And we just overlaid it to see what intersected with it. We also looked at different management regimes. So if there was a National Park Service nearby, National Monument, Wilderness Area, um, and those types of, of, of public land management schemes. Uh, we then, and, and to look at biodiversity, looked at all of the rare and endemic species that uh, data that the states house. And so we overlaid those on there. Next slide, please. And so this is just a, a map of where some of these projects occur. So uh, there's a highway, Highway 95, running uh, north and south from Las Vegas to Reno. 
Uh, there's Tonopah there. These are a huge cluster of sites west of Tonopah and north of Tonopah. Um, you can see down in that inset map where it says NV1, that is the evaporative concentration uh, lithium mine of, of Clayton Valley. That's the one that's been running since the 1960s. Next slide. Uh, Railroad Valley is another uh, uh, area with high concentration of lithium projects. This is in central Nevada. Next slide, please. And then Northwest Nevada has a series of projects scattered through from, from basically Fallon up north to the Oregon border. Next slide, please. And so as part of this project, we, we did a contract with the Desert Research Institute. Um, and DRI is a, a, a research sort of wing, if you will, institution of the, the Nevada university system. And they developed this checklist and framework to um, identify the potential hydrological impacts of lithium extraction. So I'm really focused personally on the biological impacts and the biodiversity impacts, but we really need to understand the hydrological impacts because so much biodiversity relies on the hydrology as well as both um, biodiversity and, and human consumption. And so it's essentially just a checklist. And so it asks questions, assuming that uh, someone is able to have knowledge of the hydrological system or has uh, NEPA documentation or pre-NEPA documentation of a hydrological assessment of a, of a lithium mine, they can work through this, this framework to get a sense for what may be lacking uh, and where there may be potential impacts and conflicts with the hydrology and where there may need to be more studies. And so the hope is that this type of framework will be uh, be used by folks to, to, to push companies and industry to have the highest standards possible during the permitting phase um, and to make it more transparent of where there are deficiencies in the hydrological assessments. Next slide, please. And looking at some of the more broad results from Nevada, uh, this is, I didn't update this, but as of September, there's over 21,000 lithium mine claims in Nevada. There's over 40 projects in, in Nevada. Again, this is 18 months old, so there's probably closer to 60 project sites by now. Um, lithium is moving that fast in Nevada. 30 projects proposed to use evaporative concentration. And I put those asterisks there stating that everyone has said that evaporative concentration will not be permitted. It will likely have to shift to direct lithium extraction. There were 14 state recognized special status species found on lithium project sites. 433 total species. Uh, there are 18 proposed si uh, project sites in groundwater basins that are over-appropriated. Uh, these means that there's more paper water rights than, than exist uh, of actual water in that basin. There are seven proposals in groundwater basins that are over-appropriated and over-pumped. So too many water rights, too much water is coming out. So there's a whole host of these uh, proposed lithium projects that are going to have uh, major issues with just getting water. Um, next, next slide, please. And looking at the impacts to biodiversity, um, so these are, are 12 species here, and I recognize that I should never show a table in a presentation, um, but these are 12 species that are some of the most rare and endemic species found in Nevada. These oftentimes have a range of less than maybe a couple hundred acres or even smaller. Um, there's a series of, of endemic toads, fish, plants, butterflies, and, and freshwater spring snails. Now I highlight the ones in green uh, and show that those species 100% of their range, their known range, is found entirely within a project site. So to say that another way is if that project site is developed uh, to its fullest extent of what, what, the, what the mine company proposed, that species will either A, go extinct because its habitat will be completely destroyed, or B, have to be moved elsewhere, which is not necessarily, which is not appropriate uh, in any situation. Um, these other species that have less than 100% of their, their range within a project mine site uh, are likely to be significantly impacted because if 25% if of 100-acre of, of 
range is removed. That's a huge amount of that species range. I also want to point out that out of these 12 species, um, 10 of them are dependent on wetlands uh, in some form of their, their life cycle. Most of them are fish or amphibians or spring snails, but it just goes to show how much the hydrology could impact these species as well. And the hydrology is the most challenging part to understand because it's all groundwater hydrology. And we only get to see it in the, in the spring systems where, where that groundwater comes to the surface. Next slide, please. And so looking at some of the more uh, broader concerns in the state, um, the, the way to read this is, for example, mule deer, 19 projects out of, out of 40 projects have mule deer habitat, four projects out of 40 have, have sage grouse habitat, 34 projects out of 40 have golden eagle habitat. And, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but it's clear that a lot of these projects intersect with some very important species, very important land management designations um, throughout the state. Next slide, please. And, and so just wrapping up um, some of our main conclusions, and I didn't say anything about this, but we feel like there really needs to be an incentivization for recycling and pushing for a circular economy because everything from like my cell phone to the laptop I'm talking to you on has a lithium ion battery. And that's a mineral and a metal that can be recycled. Um, hopefully eventually just like any sort of aluminum can can be uh, recycled. And so we hope that we can push for, for incentivizing recycling so we can limit the amount of mining on the landscape. Recognizing that it's likely that mining is going to occur on the landscape uh, just based on the realities of the of the economy, um, we're really pushing towards prioritizing projects that would avoid or minimize impacts on species or ecosystems, and that there needs to be work done in the lowest impact areas. Um, now, I didn't talk about the policy analysis much at all, but the main result that came out of that policy analysis was that there needs to be um, enhanced capacity at the federal and state environmental agency levels. So on projects, uh, uh, lithium projects that are moving through the process, both industry as well as communities find that the federal agencies and state agencies lack the appropriate knowledge and expertise in lithium mining to appropriately communicate between all of the different stakeholders. And a lot of that um, miscommunication has led to uh, a lot of distrust and a lot of delays in, in, in from the permitting side, a lot of uh, distrust from the community side. And so an enhanced uh, federal and state agency capacity would hopefully minimize that and allow at least better communication and better communication of impacts, uh, both good and bad, uh, and particularly the impacts to the environment um, on those communities and in those areas. Uh, I'm gonna end there. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Okay, so right now, hope oh, oh, was great. Let's see if we can take uh, questions for a few minutes, uh, and then I want to get to the next presentation. Did anybody have any questions for Michael? I don't know who has a mic around here. Uh, there's a few out there, questions. I guess I should have walked around with this mic. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, Bri Hernandez with the Bishop Pai Tribe. Um, I have a question uh, for you, Michael. Have there been has there been any identified like sustainable ways to extract lithium that you are aware or that other companies might be thinking or considering to, of doing? Maybe not here in the U.S., but maybe in like Australia or other countries. Um, I mean, there's to be honest, there's really no such thing as sustainable mining. Um, there's impacts to the surface, there's likely water impacts. Uh, but I mean, to live in the, the, the world that we live in today, we essentially have to have mining. Um, you know, there are things that we can do to mine the impacts. Uh, and that would be really focus on one, recycling, and two, 
those projects that are in areas that aren't in environmentally sensitive areas that don't have major uh, intersections with groundwater. Uh, Pete Avila, Tribal Environmental Solutions. I'm curious as to what uh, what they'll be pumping in the ground. Is it uh, acids, or or are these all top secret, or or what are the the things that they, like, goes along with? Because there's many other there's many things that have been. I'm from a copper state, so we kind of know what's going in the ground. That could affect any kind of water tables, and of course, that's our main concern. That that's a good question. I, with direct lithium extraction, the answer is I I don't know. All of those data are so proprietary that that to talk to the company, no one will give, no one will provide details because there's so much money uh, involved. I, I think Cassandra will probably talk a little bit of more, a little bit more about this, so she might have some more insights. Uh, Michael, I had a quick question. Um, most of the lithium uh, that we know of is uh, is not really land-based. It's in the ocean. Um, if, have you heard of any uh, uh, moves towards trying to uh, extract lithium from salt water? I, I've not heard major moves about extracting it from salt water. There is a large proposal to remove lithium from the Great Salt Lake, um, which is uh, a really odd type of way of extracting lithium, in my opinion. Um, but I, I haven't paid much attention to, to, to sea mining. I can pop in really quickly just to add in that with lithium and sea mining, um, generally it's a really, really low concentration of lithium and you have to move a lot of seawater. Um, so that's kind of why it hasn't been as um, looked at as terrestrial surfaces. Good afternoon, Michael. Uh, my name is Randy Lone Eagle. Uh, Chairman for the Summit Lake Paiute Tribe. I guess what I'm hearing in the presentation, and thank you for your presentation, um, is where are the tribes involved? You know, for your specifically talking for the state of Nevada, but you have 28 tribes total for the overall state. So where does that lie with the tribes being involved? That's a good question. With this analysis that we did, um, and, and, and in the report, we specifically state this, that we didn't look at any sort of cultural intersections with this and that somebody needs to look at it because that's outside of our expertise. We're, we're really focused on the biodiversity and the water issues. Um, when it comes to the permitting side, uh, we're not involved in that. And so hopefully the tribes will be involved as, as what they should be in the NEPA process. Let me uh, also address that a little bit, uh, Cliff. Um, Regarding right at Ridge, which is the uh, new lithium mine that they're doing over there by uh, Tonopah, uh, uh, southeast of Tonopah, uh, nine tribes right now are engaged with them, Bureau of Land Management. They're in a the scoping process. So right now, nine tribes. But the question is, how much do they engage with the tribes? And of course, our answer is engage with all of them. But right now, it's nine for right at Ridge. Hi, thank you for bringing this uh, this important topic to light. Uh, my name is Ali. I work with Climate Action Campaign, and I have a background in marine science. So I just wanted to touch on the deep sea mining real quick. From the deep sea community, there is currently a, a moratorium on deep sea mining until we can better understand the long-term ecological impacts that mining would have, which could be incredibly severe and have global consequences. So generally, um, it's kind of a bad idea to do deep sea mining. There's also a, um, I believe California recently passed um, a ban on deep sea mining off of the coast as well. Um, and then I also have a question for recycling. If we were to take all of our current products that have lithium in them, you know, with batteries and electronics, and we're and we were to say recycle all of that, would that currently meet the demand for lithium, um, and or would it meet the the uh, the demand that's likely going to increase as we transition more and more to renewable energies? And if not, um, 
are there alternative um, sources for other types of batteries like sodium ion and things like that that may be less environmentally extractive and have and not have the the social injustice issues that lithium can have yeah that that's a good question i don't have all the numbers off the top of my head but uh to my knowledge no it wouldn't it wouldn't solve all of our lithium issues uh but if it could keep a couple of mines off the landscape that would still be a good thing for the environment um and you're right there are other types of batteries so i've been i've heard that especially for like uh these large renewable solar facilities uh uh, the the sodium batteries might be more appropriate because of the way that the they discharge their energy um, relative to a lithium battery. Um, but the battery companies have been going through this uh, for a couple of years, and it seems like there's a lot of uh, technological innovation going on. So I would expect there to be a lot of uh, uh, new things coming out in the next couple of years because the technology changes so rapidly on it. But right now, lithium is is favored for particularly elect, electric vehicles because it's the lightest metal. Thank you, Michael. So I want to move on to the next presenter, Cassandra. And Cassandra, I'm not going to pronounce your last name. Uh, you, but can if you can introduce yourself, introduce yourself, Cassandra, and then uh, you can start up the presentation for her. Okay. Can you hear us, Cassandra? Yeah, are we ready? Yep, you're ready. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks to Clifford for inviting me to speak today. Um, my name is Cassandra Lizenby. I'm the Outreach and Just Energy Transition Director at Great Basin Resource Watch. Um, and we're a nonprofit located in Nevada with a focus on protecting the health and well being of the land, air, water, wildlife and human communities of the Great Basin um, from the adverse effects of resource extraction. So I'm hoping today to give you a little more zoomed in version on some of the impacts that we're seeing with lithium mining throughout the state. Um, so just to center us in a little bit of background here, um, the mining law that we're currently operating under is an 1800 area eras mining law. And so this was usually done with pickaxes and shovels. And now we've really transitioned into, you know, dynamite and, and tank and trucks. So, um, but we're still operating under this law. And some of those big takeaways are that mining under the 1872 federal mining law is considered the highest and best use of public lands. What this means is we have issues, um, we truck, we struggle to have conversations with regulators who sometimes feel that they can't say no to a mine, though we would argue um, against that. Um, they pay no royalties on federal land, um, which is different compared to oil and gas. And the law has no um, protections for the community or environment. So just to center us in the fact that this is the 1800 eras uh, federal mining law that lithium mining will still be operating under. Super, super briefly, um, the mining process usually has um, four general processes. It starts with exploration. Um, those are those wells and kind of claims that people have been talking about. Um, moving through to extraction, which is these large disturbances. Um, through to processing, usually where the chemical treatments and water comes into play. And then reclamation, which is returning the land to a post mining use. And I just want to put a little caveat in here that in Nevada, um, we don't have any statutory language to reclaim public waters after mining. Um, so focusing back on those different types of resource extractions for lithium, there is the brine resource. Um, the one that's currently operating that my co-presenter spoke about is the Silver Peak lithium mine. Um, outside of the Tonopah area, and that's that evaporation pond method. Um, and there's an aerial view of that mine you can see there. And I just want to add what um, was hit on a little bit, which was it is unlikely to be permitted um, because of its water use. So some of the uh, communities we speak to in the like South American region, they have turned this version of mining as water mining. 
Um, so it really is water intensive. Um, and they're now starting the experimental for the Clayton Valley pilot project, which would be this direct lithium extraction. But again, it's still experimental at this stage. Next is kind of our clay-like deposits, which is more traditional to the open pit um, hard rock mining that we've seen. And I'm going to focus in a little bit more on this type of extraction as it's what we're seeing um, pretty predominantly in the state right now. So um, recently permitted was the Thacker Pass lithium mine. Um, these are some of the anticipated these are some of the impacts of that mine that it'll have, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but also other proposed operations that are this type it includes Rhyolite Ridge, um, which is down closer to that Honopah region. So some concerns with open pit lithium mining, and I'm going to use some numbers from Thacker Pass here so we can, um, as it's been permitted, we can kind of see what some of these impacts might be. So firstly, with lithium mining, what will be different if you guys are familiar with gold mining is the leaching process will be done with acid instead of cyanide. Um, so this will be acidic mine waste um, in the tailings. Um, acid is very highly toxic um, and can be a, a source of long-term pollution. And so we see this with other copper mines in our area, like the Anaconda Copper Mine, which was also an acid leaching facility and has long-term groundwater pollution. Um, and so the acid piece of this is can be, um, is very toxic. Um, with the open pit, once the groundwater, once they go below the water table to get to some of these ore bodies, um, when they turn off the pumps, and I'll go into this a little more later, that water will fill back in the pit and can cause groundwater contamination. Um, so with Thacker Pass, the federal government actually permitted the mine to go below the water table um, and in the EIS showed that it um, could have groundwater pollution for upwards of 300 years. Um, what I want to point out is the state of Nevada did not allow the company to go below the water table because they um, were not satisfied with their mitigation for pollution. And so at current, there are two different mine plans that have been approved for the Thacker Pass project. And also with acid leaching, you have to create a sulfuric acid plant on site. Um, so these operations will be shipping in molten sulfur and burning them on site at the plant, which can release other pollutants into the airshed, such as hydrogen sulfate and sulfur dioxide. Just going to zoom in on the phase two of the Thacker Pass project. They anticipate to be producing about 5,800 tons of acid per day, um, which would be the equivalent to about 580 of these tinker trucks you can see on your right. So it's a lot of acid that's being produced. And as far as we are aware, there's no ambient air monitoring around mine sites. So the plant itself will have a monitor, but as far as community surrounding the area, um, there's no air monitoring at current that we are aware of. Um, I'm not going to go into biodiversity very much as my co-presenter touched on that. I just wanted to show with the Thacker Pass project, it will destroy 5,695 acres of habitat. And these are some of the animals that call that place home. I want to touch on some things about mining that aren't normally touched on. Um, and so this will be some different things that are a little nitty gritty detail. Um, and one of them is dewatering. So I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but when the ore is located below the water table, the mining company has to artificially lower the water table so that they can get to that ore body. What we see, however, is that the impacts of lowering that water table can expand well beyond the mine site themselves. 
So this is a map over on the right. And I wanna just say that this is the Carlin Trend Mines in Nevada. It's a collection of gold mines. And so the impacts that you're seeing here are really large from dewatering. But I want to kind of just get across that it really extends beyond mine boundaries. So that green line, that's a 10 foot groundwater drawdown of the water table. And the dark gray is the physical mine boundaries, um, just showing that this can really go beyond the site itself. And so if we're looking at specifically now the McDermott caldera, you can see the Thacker Pass lithium mine in the southern portion of the map. Um, but this map produced by Oregon Natural Desert Association shows all the rest of the lithium claims in the area. Um, and you can see it's quite extensive. So if we see dewatering at this scale, and you can see a lot of them centered around the McDermott Creek flow, um, this will have big impacts on water availability. It can impact biodiversity, habitat, losses to springs and streams. And I just want to caveat um, at GBRW, we uh, fight for source protection of culturally significant springs and streams. Um, as we have been told that the source, there is no mitigation if you lose the source, um, especially for culturally significant springs. And groundwater moves really slowly. It is not a quick moving system. So any restoration to these systems can take over 100 years. And so once they're done mining and they turn off the pumps, that groundwater fills back in and will create something called a pit lake. Rhyolite Ridge, which is outside of the Tonopah area, will have a very large pit lake. And so these pit lakes are left out on the land. Groundwater usually becomes a lower quality as it fills in through and it acts as a large diameter well as evaporation keeps taking water from the surface, it has to pull in groundwater from the surrounding area. So just to point out that we did some calculations and our calculations showed that of mines that are currently permitted in Nevada that will have a pit lake, once those pit lakes fill, about 550 billion gallons of water will be locked up in the pit lakes that are permitted at current, um, even though we're going to be seeing a lot more coming through with this lithium wave. And so the Bureau, I just want to point out super fast that BLM has reclamation rules for oil and gas that include um, reclamation of ecosystems and water systems. Um, and so we really need to be looking at how our mining reclamation kind of needs to come up too as we're talking about increased mining. I wanna talk a little bit about the tailings um, and I'll try to be fast here. Um, so the tailings at Thacker Pass will be a clay material tailings. Um, the state has deemed them as a dry tailing stack, though that's something we would argue because the clay material has a higher water content, it is really going to have a lot of unique features to it. And so the risk of failure or water pollution can be quite high if they didn't account for the amount of water the clay holds. So just for some numbers, Lithium Nevada for the Thacker Pass project will be allowed to dump 60 million tons of acidic mine tailings out on the landscape, which will likely increase to 300 million tons with later permit modification. So when we saw the water pollution control permit, we became concerned of these unique elements and we decided to have an independent assessment done. Um, by Dr. Steve Emmerman, who co-authored the Safety First Guidelines for Responsible Mine Tailings Management. We ended up appealing the permit um, on issues, and some of the key things here that I want to point out is that there's no requirement for the tailings to be neutralized, so they will continue to be acidic out on the lands. Um, and we're not entirely satisfied that the design specifications for the tailings facility 
um, is adequate with the water in the clay. And lastly, I'll just show the lightning summary from this report um, really shortly, which is it would probably have a greater water content than any tailing storage facility ever constructed. So there are pieces of this that are still unknown. And there are still outstanding questions with our current permitting process. Um, we had to have this report done within a 30 day public comment period. Um, it's a very intense report to try to put together. Um, we did not make that time frame, And so our report was dismissed and our independent consultant was not allowed to testify and our concerns have remained unaddressed. And all of this is really just to show how hard it really is to engage as concerned community in our current public, um, in our current permitting process. As far as standard outstanding questions for uh, particularly open pit lithium mining, um, you know, will there, should there be a standard to require neutralization of acidic tailings? All open pit will be this acidic leaching process. Um, how are we going to prevent groundwater pollution as the water flows through the pit? And how are we going to prevent groundwater degradation as the groundwater fills into these pit lakes, which are really legacy pollution issues on the landscape? And also, can we increase ambient air monitoring to get to these air pollution issues? And really quickly, I just want to talk about how the narrative for this is really playing out for us on the ground. So Thacker Pass, for instance, was permitted in less than one year's time. Just, um, just for like some clarity, most projects with this size with no complications will take three to five years to permit. So it was very quickly permitted. And from our standards, it's one of the worst EISs that we have seen. Um, and I already said earlier, too, that there are two different mine plans that are permitted between the federal and the state government. So those uh, that communication was missed as well. Um, we're seeing this play out in our courts. Um, and so I won't go too much into the nitty gritty, but there have been three court cases recently um, on an issue about validating mining claims. Um, and so the Rosemont case, which set the president in the ninth precedent, excuse me, in the ninth circuit, they deemed that um, the law, the agencies broke FLIPMA, the Federal Land and Policy Management Act, and so the permit was vacated. Thacker Pass, same arguments. Um, they ruled that they broke the law, but the mine was allowed to continue with no consequences. And Mount Hope, also in Nevada, um, also same arguments. They broke FLIPMA and the permit was vacated. The only difference between the two vacated permits and the permit allowed to continue is the end use product. Um, so lithium being the end use that's allowed to continue. And lastly, we're seeing this play out in our policy too. Uh, Nevada State Senator Catherine Cortez Masto introduced the Mining Regulatory Clarity Act last year, which was an attempt to try to create clarity around those three previous court decisions. Um, but in, in its language, how it did that was actually pulling back protections from that 1872 mining law. Um, we're seeing NEPA cuts coming out through budget. Um, we're seeing conversations around FAST 41, how to fast track problem or permits and projects. Um, and we're seeing government loans for projects. And so what I want to point out with the government loans is that we're actually seeing projects that haven't totally gone through their permitting yet and satisfied their community outreach and tribal consultation are getting money ahead of time. So how does community feel they can hold into that? And so I'll just try to wrap it up here uh, with community right to know. Um, this is defined with, by the United Nations as the right for people to participate in an informed way in decisions that affect them. 
So common practice, mining companies pay contractors for technical analysis, and the communities usually have a lot of distrust in that. There has created a tension. So this community right to know principle is intended to open up transparency, allow for directly affected communities to have access to independent assessors, which allow them to have toe-to-toe -to -toe discussions and negotiations with mining companies. Um, and there is a model for this in the Superfund. So we, so we can bring this to the front end of this process. And with that, I will just add that litigation is usually why permitting goes so slowly. And that litigation usually comes from this distrust. So how can we revitalize that? And so we're asking for the need for communities to have access to independent analysis. And lastly, I just want to wrap us up with what's at stake here. Um, are we going to lose out on judicious permitting as we try to streamline things? Are we going to lose out on industry accountability um, with that narrative? And we really can't be looking the other way on the on the quality of analysis just because of a product's end use. Um, we could be rushing through needless pollution and environmental damage. And I just want to add a lot of those figures around how much lithium we're going to need. Those comes from assumptions, assumptions like everyone getting a new EV. Um, and there are different policies we can push to try to change those assumptions. Um, we have to protect sacred sites. Um, we hear over and over again, there's no mitigation for sacred landscapes. Um, and as indigenous communities, they're the ones who are going to be facing the burden of this transition. So we have to make sure that that becomes part of our decision making and and raise to the same level as a lot of our other decision making. Um, and we should find just solutions to addressing the climate crisis, including centering directly affected communities and pulling them into the permitting instead of pushing them away. By doing this, we can reduce the need for new mines. We can protect biodiversity and carbon sinks and at the same time protect water resources. And I'll end there. If there's any more questions, you can take a picture of this slide. Um, this has our contact information on it. And I do have to apologize, Cassandra. We ran out of time about oh, two minutes shit. ago. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to propose is I'll share with Roman uh, out of the R talk, and then we'll communicate to the tribes the contact information for follow up. It'd be nice to have a discussion uh, with a, not just these two places, two people, but or three people, but others to discuss these uh, items because uh, I think they're paramount importance to us and I'm concerned about misinformation getting out there. And so I think this presentation creates some transparency on this process, which is now being defined as clean energy. Um, and so no I'd like apologies, to when I was sharing my screen, I couldn't see the time session thing anymore. So. Yeah, you said uh, <laughs> for the, the last, thing and it's like four times you said that so <laughs> <laughs> last thing not so, quite last thing not quite <laughs> but really th thank you michael and cassandra i uh, don't have any time for questions guys but we'll yeah so again i'll share their information uh through the r talk and then if you guys want to connect with them they're both great resources nature conservancy and great basin resource watch so yay, our conference is over. That's a good way to end it in a in a dour note. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks you guys. And I'll send you guys pics. <laughs> yes.
Appreciate that. We're yeah, at ITCA. We're trying to this is time, and uh, as I get more staff, now I find the time to do that. But we want to coordinate more with the nonprofits, the other nonprofits, and we're also seeing through environmental justice a lot of money going to for the kind of coordinated efforts between nonprofits. So the thing for me is. Uh, environmental justice started with urban areas, so getting them to invest in rural areas is what we're dealing with right now because Nevada is very rural. Yeah, a lot of the concerns. The way the laws are written for 